Falt. I'm Garen Stone, I'm the Global Medicine Program Director here in the Center for Global Health in the Department of Medicine. And really it's an honor and privilege once again to welcome you to MGH Global Health Grand Rounds. And this month, we are uh, really uh, fortunate to have Dr. Wendy Macias Constantopoulos, who is an associate professor in the emergency medicine department here um, within MGH and Harvard Medical School. She completed her Global Health Leadership Fellowship here at MGH and an MPH from the School of Public Health here at Harvard. She's the Endowed Scholar for Leadership in Emergency Medicine and Director of the Center for Social Justice and Health Equity in the MGH Emergency Department. She's the founding executive director of the Mass General Freedom Clinic, which is a really, and we're excited to hear about this, an innovative primary and preventive health clinic for human trafficking victims and survivors that won the 2014 Partnership for Freedom National Competition. The MGH Freedom Clinic also serves as the medical home for a unique collaboration with the nonprofit Hostage US, which I hope we get a chance to hear about through which trauma-informed medical care and coordination is provided for repatriated American captives and their families. Her research and programmatic efforts focus on expanding knowledge and closing the challenging structural gaps that perpetuate health inequities. And she's the five term elected chair of Mass Med Society's Committee on Violence Intervention and Prevention and serves on various state and federal groups engaging education policy advocacy on behalf of traffic individuals. This was a session we had initially, I think, planned on having last April, um, but due to the pandemic, um, unfortunately got delayed. And so it's my privilege today to, to welcome Dr. Um, Messias Constantopoulos and turn it over to you. The CME information is in the chat and we encourage everyone to, to place questions in there. We'll moderate a Q&A afterwards. So thank you, Dr. Macias Constantopoulos. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Stone. This is an amazing introduction, um, more than expected. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with all of you today on this uh, snowy morning. Um, so I'll start by saying that I am tr doing this from home, which is uh, very unusual for me. I meant to be in my office this morning. Um, so, you know, please uh, accept my apologies in advance if you hear any background noise, but I'll try to keep it down um, in the background. Um, so today I'm going to talk with you about uh, human trafficking and we're going to do some just basic um, introductions to human trafficking. Let me see if I can advance the slide. Okay, great, that works. I have no um, financial conflicts of interest to disclose. And we're gonna cover a few things today. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna provide a background uh, about human trafficking, including the scope and socio-ecological socio factors that increase vulnerability. We'll talk also about the physical and um, psychological health impacts of trafficking and some of the potential barriers to healthcare. And then we'll end with uh, talking about trauma-informed care and how that is a critical component uh, to engaging survivors of tra trafficking in long-term care. Um, so to begin with, I want all of us to be on the same uh, playing field. I want us to understand what human trafficking is. And although there are many different definitions and many laws, if you look globally at all the various international and uh, uh, country-specific tools, I'll uh, refer to the US federal law to define trafficking here. Um, so the 2000 um, Trafficking Victims Protection Act has been amended several times, but it defines uh, severe forms of trafficking in persons as uh, sex trafficking, which is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, obtaining, patronizing, or soliciting of a person for the purpose of a commercial sex act, in which the commercial sex act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or in which the person who is induced to perform this act has not attained the age of 18. And it defines a commercial sex act as a sex act performed in exchange for anything of value to any person. So many of you have probably heard about um, how you know young people in particular uh, will be, uh, especially those who are homeless, uh, might exchange sex for a place to sleep, uh, for food, for money. And so that would fall under this uh, umbrella of sex trafficking. Labor trafficking, on the other hand, is also similar. The, similarly, the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of subjection to involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. And so very similar uh, to sex trafficking, there are three elements that are involved in uh, this issue of 
um, trafficking, the crime of trafficking. Um, and those three elements are force, fraud, and coercion. Um, so force, will ref refer to force when we're talking about anything that is related to physical, physicality. So physical restraint, physical harm, sexual assault, beatings, uh, physical confinement, and even um, uh, physically monitoring someone. Uh, this is an effective way that traffickers use uh, to sort of break uh, the will of the uh, victims that they intend to uh, exploit. Um, fraud is another form by which uh, human trafficking is committed, and that refers to false promises or unexpected changes in the um, contract agreement, for example. Um, this is something that we see particularly uh, in young people who are, you know, might be enticed to uh, enter into a situation of trafficking by being promised an opportunity for um, fame or an opportunity to go to college for an education um, and also seen in international um, labor migration where someone might be recruited to do a particular work in a, abroad in a different country um, might be told that that work relates to um, something like let's say a restaurant uh, business and then when they arrive it turns out that it's not exactly what they were promised uh, the conditions have changed the nature of the work has changed um, their compensation uh, may be completely gone um, and there may be some agreements around debt that are uh, that that are exploited so particularly for international folks who are migrating for labor uh, you know, they might say uh, the contract might entail working for a certain amount of time to pay back the visas, the work visas, to pay back the fees related to travel, and to pay back the broker fee for having found them employment. And there's a set amount of time that it takes to pay that money back. And it may be that then they are also incurring debt along the way. And that all that gets into debt bondage, um, where even by being given a place to sleep or a meal um, the, or a uh, ride from the place where they sleep to the place where they work, everything comes with a, with a um, fee attached to it. And so the debts are not meant to be paid off. Um, and then there's coercion. Uh, which can look and look many look different in many different situations, uh, depending on the type of trafficking and the environment in which they're in. But it can involve um, blackmail, and we have uh, many examples of that happening here in the United States. Psychological manipulation, where someone might be, um, you know, forced or um, enticed into enter into a situation uh, because they are feeling um, uh, psychologically bonded to the trafficker. Um, so that's something that we see, for example, with sex trafficking, where the um, trafficker might, uh, you know, first approach the victim through a romantic relationship. Then there's confiscation of documents, uh, threats to the person who is being victimized, threats to others uh, if they don't do what the trafficker says, the other might be hurt, and threats to loved one, and also threats of arrest or deportation. So there are many different ways in which force, fraud, or coercion can be used, but if those elements are involved and someone is being exploited for some form of labor and there is some form of profit on the other end, then that would be considered human trafficking. We know that uh, globally there are approximately 29 point uh, 20.9 million persons worldwide who are trafficked um, this is a very um, I have to say that prevalence is is uh, difficult with this crime it's a clandestine crime no one really stands up and declares themselves a human trafficking victim um, and uh, it's difficult to detect so there are many different figures prevalence figures out there um, this is probably the one that has been uh, touted the most as potentially being the most accurate. Um, this was done by the International Labor Organization who, together with other agencies around the world, were able to uh, perform some 
complex research that is used for um, populations in migration. And with the influx and outflux of individuals, they were able to ascertain that there were about 20.9 million, give or take 1.4 million. So it really is uh, you know, still as accurate as we can get it, but not accurate enough. Um, of the 29, of the 20.9 million, 16.4 were um, enforced labor and 4.5 were enforced commercial sex. A follow-up study to this was done by some um, economists who estimated that um, human trafficking um, uh, generates approximately 150 billion US dollars in illegal profits. And we know from this study that the majority are female with about 55% of them being female and children account for about a quarter of that um, population who is trafficked. Regionally, if we look at what trafficking looks like in different parts of the globe, we know that there are certain regions that have more prevalence than others. And this gives you us an idea of where uh, trafficking is occurring around the world. Um, as you can see, this, you know, uh, Northern America and Western Europe um, account for about 7% of trafficking um, victims. Um, and then you have other areas of the world that are um, a lot more dense in terms of their trafficking um, situation. And what I will say is that in many areas of the world, what we define as trafficking and what international uh, um, instruments define as trafficking uh, may not be recognized as trafficking. It may be just something that they think of as being their lot in life, the you know family that they were born in, the situations that they were born into. Um, so keep that in mind that in some places it may not even be recognized. Um, in terms of the illegal profits that uh, are generated from trafficking, as you can see, this is the benefit of being close to a screen. Um, but as you can see, uh, the Asia Pacific region accounts for the largest amount of profit from forced labor in, um, annually. And then developed economies account for the second largest uh, amount of profits. Um, and, and this is really sort of dis disturbing because we account for 7% of trafficking in that previous map, but yet our profits are huge. And so there's a very um, uh, significant incentive financially for trafficking in, in the world and in these areas in specific. On the right side, you can see some of the industries in which um, people are trafficked and sexual exploitation by far is the largest of them. So there was a follow-up study to that ILO study from 2012 um, that was performed in 2016 in collaboration with Walk Free Foundation and the International Organization for Migration. And they ended up adding into the mix. So they had looked at forced labor and they had looked at forced commercial sex they ended up adding forced marriage because around the world in many places, forced marriage um, is uh, certainly accepted as a form of trafficking, as a type of trafficking that occurs and that affects mostly um, young girls um, and young adult, uh, young adult women. Um, and many of these women are and girls are entering in being forced to marry they're entering into situations of forced labor and forced sex and in many cases um, you know they might be not only laboring within the home but also laboring outside of the home uh, to bring in money so it is in many parts of the world uh, and by international um, standards considered a form of um, trafficking and slavery. So in 2016, they added this and they found that 40.3 million people worldwide are, um, are being trafficked or are in some form of modern day slavery. Um, and again, 5.4, um, I'm sorry, one out of every four are children. So 25% are children. Of those who are commercially sexually trafficked, um, children account for 21%. So it's a large number of children who are um, in all, you know, by all means, uh, 
and by all definitions are being sexually abused. Um, disproportionately, women and girls account for 71% of modern day slavery. And um, if you break it down by the forms that they've been looking at, 99% of those who are in forced sexual exploitation are women and girls, 58% of them in forced labor, 40% are in state sponsored labor, and 84% are in forced marriage. So some of the tactics that are used by traffickers to recruit and exploit um, their uh, next victims are um, tactics that we should be aware of. I'm just trying to adjust something on my screen. Give me one second, sorry. Go back. Okay, so Um, males account, um, I'm sorry, uh, there's threats of violence, um, acts of violence, and threats against family um, were found to be some of the uh, major forms that are used uh, for recruiting and then for exploiting and maintaining control. Um, males in particular were found to be vulnerable to threats of violence to family, um, so they're uh, wanting to protect their family, put them at greater risk. Um, wages being withheld, actual confinement, um, denial of food and sleep, threats of legal action. And then for females, um, a, the largest, uh, by far the largest uh, um, number of women who were suffering from any form of violence were suffering from sexual violence. And uh, documents also being withheld uh, seems to affect females more than males. Um, so specifically looking at human trafficking in the United States, um, in between the years 2008 and 2010, um, the U.S. Uh, was uh, conducting a study through the Department of Justice looking at their data uh, that was coming through the human trafficking task forces around the country. Um, at any given time, given, you know, give or take uh, funding, um, there are at, there is at least one human trafficking task force in every state, but you know, not 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 exactly. There's about 48 of them, but at least that's the um, what's supposed to be happening. Um, between 2008 and 2010, they started looking at their data of incidents of suspected human trafficking coming into the reporting system, um, and and this gives you a sense of what they found. You know, but yearly the numbers were increasing. And um, the largest proportion of the reported cases were suspected cases of sex trafficking. This may not necessarily reflect what's truly happening in the United States. It may just be that we are a lot more aware of sex trafficking. Um, it may be that sex trafficking affects children uh, more, um, and we'll see that a little bit, affects children more so than labor trafficking does. And so there may be a hyper awareness around sex trafficking. It's also what tends to make the media and what tends to make Hollywood movies. Um, and it's also the type of trafficking that is less involved in sort of political quagmires like labor trafficking being involved in sort of our immigration policies. Um, so it tends to get a lot more attention. Now, does it really reflect what's happening in, in the US? That's hard to know. But in any case, what they ended up doing was taking just the, 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 the very tip of the iceberg of these cases, the ones that they felt were most, most likely to represent a true case of human trafficking. They did not have the funds uh, or resources to be able to investigate all these cases. So um, essentially they looked at um, about 2,500 cases out of all of those and broke it down um, by demographics and by type of trafficking. So if they looked at just the labor trafficking um, uh, pool, they found that 95% were foreign born nationals, 67% uh, were undocumented, while 28% were legally in the United States. So you can see that even for those who are legally here, this can be a, um, a, a sort of unfortunate outcome of their migration. 68% um, of them are female, and 38% um, were under the age of 25, while 10% were under the age of 18. And you can see from the pie chart that uh, 
by far Hispanics account for the largest uh, amount, the largest uh, proportion of this population, accounting for about 54% of those who are labor trafficked in the US. And that makes sense given our geography and given our migratory, migration patterns in the US. Um, but contrast that to US, uh, to sex trafficking in the US. And this looks a little bit more um, like an equal opportunity type of um, uh, situation where we do see a larger proportion of the population who are trafficked for sex being black with 35% being involved in um, or being exploited in trafficking, in sex trafficking, um, while uh, Hispanics and whites account for a, a 20, just a, just a little bit of over than over 20. Um, and of these um, sex trafficking victims, 83% were US citizens or residents, 94% um, were female. So there's must be said explicitly that there's a smaller number of those who are sex trafficked who are male or who are um, of a, um, uh, um, a non-conforming gender. And 87% are younger than 25, 55% are what we would say are children under the age of 18. So again, sex trafficking seems to affect children a lot more than labor trafficking and maybe one of the reasons why it tends to get more attention. This study has not been repeated. Uh, the US Department of Justice conducted this in 20, or reported this in 2011. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have um, more updated uh, data at this point in time. Um, Looking across the United States, uh, this is a hot map of trafficking. And we can see that uh, pretty much every state in the US, all 50 states, um, including all US territories, have reported cases of human trafficking. Um, and from this hot map, you can see uh, that um, there are areas where there are more cases being reported. Again, unclear if that's because more trafficking is happening in these areas or simply because there's more recognition and reporting happening in this in these areas. Um, but the important thing is to understand that this is something that is impacting us in the US in all states um, and we need to be aware of it. Looking at some of the data that has come into the National Human Trafficking Hotline, which is run by the Polaris Project um, they, over the years, over the last, uh, between 2007 and 2017, over those 10 years, they have had 40,987 calls to the hotline. Um, calls are being made by survivors as well as by um, uh, professionals who are working with survivors. Um, of the calls uh, that were made by um, survivors, you can see that this has climbed over the years. Um, in, in 2017, there were 2,144 survivors that called the hotline seeking assistance. Oh, I apologize for that. Um, the uh, this this the data from the from the U.S. also uh, gives us a sense of the types of industries that are involved in trafficking, and um, this gives you a sense of what's happening in the U.S. And you can see that um, healthcare is in there, so we know that there are people who are working um, in nursing homes, taking care of our elderly. Um, who may not uh, be getting paid um, appropriately. And uh, they're, of course, the companies that, uh, that contract them out are, are being paid by the healthcare system. But the question is um, the company itself paying its workers. So there are many different um, avenues and industries in which people are trafficked in the US, landscaping, carnivals, restaurant business, domestic work in, in private homes, um, construction, and so forth. Um, looking at some of the demographics here in the US um, through uh, the calls that are being made to the, um, to the hotline, um, you can see that the, the largest number are adults, uh, but there are minors um, involved. Um, the largest uh, proportion is female, but there are other genders also being trafficked. And then again, in terms of um, race and ethnicity, there's a little bit more of a equal 
opportunity there that is occurring, um, but Latinos um, have a, a slightly larger number um, if you're just looking at numbers. And then for um, age of trafficking, um, we know that um, in terms of the um, sex, uh, sex, uh, commercial sex trafficking, uh, it is more likely that they're going to be trafficked at a young age. And so you can see that the majority of them are being trafficked right around um, ages 15 through 17. So that's, where, that's when they're first um, entering into uh, some form of exploitation. So what are some of the vulnerability factors? And, you know, this is sort of a drop in the bucket um, because there are many different um, circumstances that can put people at risk of being trafficked. And really there's it, this, the, this list of factors that leave people vulnerable to trafficking can impact anybody. And so, you know, really anybody is at risk of being trafficked. Um, Family dysfunction can lead to being dis, um, to being trafficked if there isn't a cohesive family unit, um, especially children are at risk of being trafficked. Um, lack of social family support, uh, so there may not necessarily be dysfunction, but there may be some sort of um, distance that separates families and that puts people at risk. Um, lack of financial means particularly here in the US and uh, around the world. Poverty seems to be um, a, 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 a vulnerability factor for trafficking. Um, you know, people are more likely to do work that they otherwise would not do. They're more likely to enter into contracts um, that may be um, exploitative, um, that they otherwise may not need to um, enter into uh, employment contracts of the sort. Um, and, uh, and also um, there's uh, more uh, likelihood that younger uh, people in the family, so children might be sent out to work um, for the family. And so that puts the children at risk as well. Um, housing instability and homelessness is also a major problem. And uh, here in the US, we know that runaway and homeless youth are particularly at risk of being um, trafficked, of having to uh, exchange uh, sex for a roof uh, or a bed to sleep in at night or for food. Um, so that leaves them particularly vulnerable. Substance use can be um, a means of uh, vulnerability as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few slides. Um, people who are involved in gangs have to contribute to the gang economy. And for boys, they might be um, forced to engage in drug trafficking um, and to engage in criminal activity. For girls, they might be forced to engage in commercial sex. Um, persons with disability are certainly at risk. Ethnic and racial minorities, as we can see, um, are uh, at risk uh, depending on the type of trafficking. Um, socially discriminated groups such as LGBTQ, um, especially youth, are at risk. Um, and some of you may know this, but LGBTQ account for maybe approximately 10% of the general population when we're talking about youth. Um, but they account for 40% of youth who are homeless in the United States. They're more likely to be kicked out of their home or to run away from home because of uh, you know, inability to be accepted in the home. So they're definitely at risk. And then as we saw um, immigrants, it, it, regardless of their immigration status and those who are unable to communicate in the language of the country that they live in. Um, so this is a, just a quick look at the Polaris uh, power and wheel, uh, power and control wheel. And it gives you a sense of the various different um, tactics that are used by traffickers to maintain control. Um, so I'll just point out a few of them, but I won't go through all of this. Um, you know, big, uh, one big thing is coercion and threats. And we talked about threats against family and blackmail. Um, Intimidation is another one um, where they might even harm people who in in their in their in front of others to kind of show them what could be done and what could happen to them if they were to not comply with the wishes of the trafficker. Um, this emotional abuse um, 
violence intermixed with kindness is very confusing and it leads to trauma bonding. And this is the psychological manipulation that I spoke about a little bit earlier, um, especially for sex trafficking and in the case of romantic recruitment where the trafficker poses as a boyfriend. Um, this is uh, a way of maintaining control of keeping um, sort of um, keeping them um, uh, the leash kind of short um, and keeping them from getting help because the uh, victim feels that they're probably in a romantic relationship that is abusive as opposed to a trafficking situation. In many, in many cases, um, the victims don't even recognize that they're being trafficked. They, they know that there's something wrong and that there might be some abuse, but may not recognize that they're being trafficked. So what's the role of healthcare professionals? Well, we know from research um, being done that um, trafficking survivors are accessing healthcare. Trafficking victims and survivors, I'll refer to victims if they're still in the trafficking situation, survivors if they're making their way out or have been out. Uh, but they're um, accessing care. Um, and studies have shown that up to 87.8% .8 of trafficking survivors report having encountered a healthcare professional while they were trafficked. Um, and uh, none of them report being um, uh, identified and or helped or assisted. Um, paying a little bit of uh, honor to uh, some of the giants in this field, uh, Catherine Zimmerman from the UK uh, per conducted a study very early on in this work in 2008, looking at 192 women in Europe who were being um, uh, engaged in post-trafficking services, and they found that um, all of them reported to some degree um, some form of physical abuse or sexual uh, or sexual abuse, like practically all of them, 95%. Uh, um, some of the physical symptoms that they were suffering from and seeking um, health uh, services for um, were very vague symptoms that as you can imagine, you may all see this in your clinics. I see it in the emergency department. Um, someone comes in with a headache. It's hard to really get to the bottom of what's the cause of that headache. And, you know, we tend to focus on the clinical aspect and not so much sort of the holistic and the background of what is happening with that person. And so things are missed. And this is just to say that all the symptoms that are reported can be extremely vague. Um, this is a more comprehensive list uh, looking at the studies that have been done over the years and um, bringing all that information together. We know that in terms of physical health, there are traumatic injuries that can be intentional as well as accidental. Um, if somebody works uh, in construction sites or uh, fishing boats, uh, you know, these injuries may um, end up seeming like occupational injuries um, and nothing more than that when they present for care, if they present for care. Um, chemical um, exposures can also occur, particularly in the, industri in the agricultural industry here in the US. For example, communicable diseases just from overcrowding um, living conditions, um, untreated chronic diseases from lack of being able to access care um, and so forth, uh, down to homicide or accidental death. Um, and then reproductive health, um, which seems to impact women uh, more so than men, um, can range from, you know, injuries to physical injury to the um, to the vaginal region or the perineum or the rectum, um, to frequent sexually transmitted infections, um, the diseases that uh, that proceed from those uh, in uh, untreated infections, to um, pregnancy, unsafe, uh, forced abortions, the related complications, um, and so forth. And then mental health is probably one of the largest buckets to think about. Um, I like to say that even if someone is never touched, never scratched, the, the mental health outcomes uh, from trafficking are pretty significant. Um, just the idea of someone controlling your every move and um, the idea that someone has that much power over you um, can lead people um, into um, you know, depression, anxiety, PTSD, 
um, dissociation if they're being physically um, physically violated, uh, they might dissociate, um, and that might become a, an issue going forward, um, and lead to substance use disorders as a way to cope with what is happening, um, and suicide. So you can pretty much see anything um, as a result of trafficking. It has a huge impact on the phys physical and the mental health of victims. Pregnancy, I wanna talk a little bit about because it is one of the um, ways in which um, women are um, not only controlled, but also recruited. Um, so if they are um, broken down uh, through acts of violence, uh, sexual violence, um, in some cases they might be um, intentionally impregnated and then with the intention of having a forced abortion. And that is a way that they further break her down and make her feel that she is worthless and make her feel that she doesn't deserve to be loved. And it's a sort of psychological way of keeping them bonded to their situation. Um, substance use can be a way of recruiting, but also a way of um, controlling. Um, so, so it may be that they purposefully recruit someone who uses substances um, because they know that that person is going to need access to drugs and that's an easy way to control someone. Or it may be that, they're, that the individual is introduced to substances while being trafficked. So they're forced to use substances in order to cope with what is happening, uh, in order to keep them subdued. And then once they're introduced, they become addicted. And once they become addicted, that's a, a way to control them. And it can be used as a reward if they're good and they do what they're told, or it can be used as a punishment by withholding it if they're not doing what they're told. So it's an easy way for traffickers to really sort of gain control over, um, over the people that they intend to exploit. Um, in terms of access to care, uh, there are many different barriers to accessing care that have been reported um, by survivors of trafficking. Um, and this is if the trafficker allows them to access care. Um, so lack of insurance, fear of being deported, being, fear for young kids, fear of being reported to DCF, maybe where they came from they felt was worse than the situation that they're in and they don't wanna go back to where they came from. Um, and then it, it, you know the traffickers could teach them to um, fear and have distrust of others um, and particularly anyone who's in a position to help them. Um, so while we may not deport someone, they've been told that they're going to be deported if they come into the emergency department. And so th those are different ways in which um, you know, traffickers will control um, victims again from being able to access care. But if they do access care, we know that emergency departments are a large proportion of where they are entering into the healthcare system. Um, but we must keep in mind that there is still a good proportion of patients uh, of these victims who are accessing care through their primary care, through urgent care clinics, through community health clinics. So really important for all of us to be aware, not just those in emergency medicine. I'm going to skip over this because um, I don't want to run out of time. Um, but looking at how to engage with um, trafficking um, survivors and victims, it's really important to recognize that trauma impacts how an individual behaves, how they um, access care, how they engage in care, to acknowledge their vulnerabilities as um, survivors of trauma, whatever that trauma may be. Um, it's important to minimize the chances that you're going to re-traumatize someone in the process of caring for them and important to foster and, and empower them and foster their recovery, their health, and their well-being. Um, we know that uh, trauma, even one single event, can have a large impact on a person's ability to cope um, in the future. We know that it can lead to maladaptive behaviors and we know that the more that someone feels that they are understood and that their trauma is um, you know, something that is not uh, um, unique to them, uh, the more that they will feel safe and um, better able to access their care. 
Um, we also know that there are many triggers in the healthcare system uh, that can lead to someone escalating um, and potentially leaving against medical advice or having a, um, a, a breakdown in the relationship with the, with the healthcare provider. Um, so we must be aware of some of those um, triggers and try to avoid um, triggering our patients. And if they do get triggered, we need to know how to sort of first aid, um, uh, first aid mental health, um, how to kind of calm them down and help them through that, um, that uh, moment of being feeling, feeling unsafe. Um, we know that trafficking leads to a loss of sense of safety, a loss of the sense of agency of being able to be in, in control and being able to make one's own decisions and the loss of predictability because that's one of the ways that the traffickers will control them by you know, uh, keeping things unpredictable for them. And so the trauma-informed approach really calls for us to um, respect our patients, have patience, provide them with the dignity, meet them where they're at, not push them in a way that they're not ready to be pushed. Um, we need to minimize re-traumatization um, and really sort of be careful with our language and our body language as well. Um, promote their safety, their healing, their recovery, um, empowering them by highlighting their, their strengths um, and their resilience. Um, so, you know, highlighting the fact that anybody else in their position would have, wouldn't have survived. So, you know, having them understand that they are stronger than they think they are. Um, sharing in decision making, um, so allowing them to partake talking to them about what their options are and allowing them to partake in those decisions, being transparent and predictable. So telling them ahead of time what to expect, but also in terms of transparency, if you're going to talk about uh, and ask about trafficking or any form of abuse, letting them know ahead of time that there are certain situations where you might have to get others involved because we are all mandated reporters. And then understand their behavior. So if they are belligerent and they are combative or they're upset with you and angry, understand that that is not, uh, that is coming from a place of a lot of hurt and a lot of trauma and that we need to manage our own uh, reactions to that and not escalate it. Um, so if you're going to inquire and ask about um, trafficking and sort of try to dig deeper, um, it's important to use a trauma-informed approach to ensure privacy, confidentiality, to talk about the limits of confidentiality since we're mandated reporters, to use professional interpreters, avoid using people that are there with them because the person who's accompanied them might be related or might be the trafficker. Um, normalize the the questions um, and this these are all sort of the same principles that we use around asking for about intimate partner and domestic violence we need to normalize it and not make them feel that you know they're unique in this situation there are many people who um, go through this and we ask everybody about this um, so that type of language can be helpful um, using neutral language so if they refer to their trafficker as their boyfriend you don't want to turn around and start referring to the trafficker as um, some other um, term like um, you know, trafficker or pimp. Um, you want to convey an open door policy as well if they're not ready to talk about it, if they're not ready to um, disclose what is happening to them, but your suspicion, your suspicion is there, just let them know that you're there if they, if and when they change their mind, if and when it starts to not feel safe, that you are there for them. Um, and then respect their decisions to not engage in further um, care uh, or services. Um, there are many questions out there that are used for assessing trafficking. The important thing to know is that there's not a single question that will get at everything. And so what we really need to do is to converse with our patients, to sit down eye level and talk with our patients and have a normal conversation and ask them how they're feeling, if they're feeling safe, you know, what is going on in their lives. And if you can do that, you will probably be able to get to um, whether or not someone might be exploited. If you do have uh, someone disclose, um, thank them for trusting you, for confiding in you, because that is a big deal. They've just told you something that they've never wanted to speak out loud, that they've never wanted to tell anybody. It, there's a lot of shame involved in this, uh, a lot of self-blame, particularly for sex trafficking, but also for labor trafficking. So you know, thank them for, for trusting you. 
first and foremost, because they're going to want to take it back and they're going to want to, you know, not put it all back in the box as soon as they let it out. Um, determine at that point whether or not you need to um, file some sort of reporting um, process. Um, if you feel that the patient or staff are in danger uh, because the person, and I've, I know this happens on our inpatient floors and it certainly happens in the emergency department where they might be getting a visitor who is the trafficker. So if you feel that the staff or the person is in danger and you want to involve security, just talk to the patient about that and make sure that they know um, and uh, share in those decisions. Do some safety planning with them, get social work involved um, to help them do safety planning. If it's a child, obviously get child protection team involved um, and engage as many of our hospital services because even Haven, which is our uh, domestic violence uh, program at MGH, um, has, uh, has addressed trafficking among their um, clients and they're very knowledgeable about resources and about how to um, pro continue to provide services beyond the uh, hospital. Um, and then offer to contact law enforcement, but never do so without their permission because they know um, what their situation is and they'll know if it's a safe, um, if it's safe to contact and to get law enforcement involved at that moment. Um, Finally, if you have any questions about um, trafficking or you have a patient that you think you need to be um, uh, uh, needs to know about this um, resource, you can give them the 1-888-373-7888 trafficking hotline. I uh, never give this to anybody on a piece of paper in case the trafficker were to find it on them. Um, so what I help them do is memorize it. And um, it, to the left of the screen, you'll see that conveniently, the 3737 translates into ER, ER. Um, so I use that to help them memorize it. Or if 37 happens to be an important number in that person's life, they might remember it in a different way. But flank um, the 3737 with the 8888, which is a toll free, and you've got the hotline. And then um, hopefully they can access it as needed as well and get help when needed. Um, I'll just spend a couple of minutes talking about the Mass General Freedom Clinic. Um, it is a um, clinic that was founded in 2015. It's an unmarked referral only clinic. We provide primary preventative and have, um, and we provided mental health care previously um, within the um, clinic itself. Now we have way too many uh, patients who require mental health um, and uh, so we do have to refer out for that. Um, and we have had patients who have been labor, sex, and organ trafficked, and we care for those who are 13 years of age and older. We do this from a strengths-based, trauma-informed approach. We try to engage them in a safe manner and uh, provide a safe space where they feel understood, where they feel like they're not unique. Um, they're not particularly um, you know, I don't mean to say not unique, but not particularly um, different um, and uh, where it's understood that it could happen to anybody. Um, and then we use um, what we learn from the clinic to inform our practices as well. Um, and we engage at the local, state, and regional level. Um, we are part of the New England Anti-Trafficking Coalition, uh, which is a regional um, uh, coalition uh, of the six New England states. And I'll end with saying that human trafficking above all is a human rights violation. It violates uh, numerous um, human rights. Um, I can't go into all of them or go into detail about how, um, but I think it's pretty self-explanatory that um, you know this is a horrific um, situation for a lot of people. Um, and it is incumbent on us who are seeing them in our um, clinics and in our emergency departments and um, in our settings, in our clinical settings to really try to be part of the solution. And so with that, I will take questions and I apologize that we don't have more time for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Masis Constantopoulos. It was really uh, fabulous to hear about your work and the Freedom Clinic here and really um, just incredible efforts you're making on behalf of, of 
those that are survivors and victims of human trafficking. I invite everyone to enter questions into the chat and to refer them up. But maybe um, I would love to maybe start with a couple of questions um, just based on my own experience with some um, patients. It seems like the, the levers of manipulation and the ways in which people get entwined in this um, are very deep. And, and so I've seen it. Um, it's been a tougher to get people out of this as well. And I think some of those sort of those linger. Um, and I would love to hear from you and your experience at the Freedom Clinic. Um, sort of what thinking about what success looks like, what have been the keys to sort of helping people free themselves from this sort of cycle almost of, of, of trafficking? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. It's different um, from person to person, but what I will say is that one of the common themes is that it takes a lot for um, for a v person who is being victimized in this way to sort of extract themselves. As I mentioned, there's a lot of trauma bonding happening, particularly for sex trafficking, and there's a lot of um, fear being instilled in um, victims of trafficking um, in terms of accessing services. And so for labor trafficking, that can be really um, difficult. Um, particularly, we see some domestic, we have, we've had domestic um, workers who have been um, beaten, sexually abused, uh, confined to the private home of their uh, boss, uh, of their, um, I guess, uh, trafficker. Um, and just don't know their rights, are scared to, to turn to the police. They know that what's happening is wrong, but um, you know, they struggle with that. And I think in terms of how to, how to help, you know, we've had, um, we've ha we have a range of different um, sort of where people are in their trafficking, um, in the trafficking spectrum. We've had people who are out, um, patients who are, who have been out for 10 years and those who are still in and those who are trying to make their way out. Um, and I think patience is a virtue, right? Like we just want to help them. We just want to get them out, but it's not about rescue and it's not about saving them. It's about giving them the, the, the confidence the and the sort of the knowledge to know how to do it um but it it does take time and it, some of you may have heard that may have heard uh said that you know for domestic violence or intimate partner violence it takes seven time seven attempts to leave the abuser before you actually leave and it's very similar in terms of trafficking it really there's a lot there's so much fear and so much back and forth and so much second guessing and so much um, worry that you know their loved ones or families back home in their countries or here in the U.S. if it's someone from the U.S. is at risk of being harmed. Um, so I think just kind of helping them to come up with the plan of how they're going to do it. Safety planning is a huge part of this. Safety planning, um, you know, if it does get to the point where you feel that your life is in danger, here's your plan, right? And the more that they feel that that plan can work and the more that they feel that there there's opportunity and that they that they have rights and that people care and there's someone to turn to and there are resources the more they feel networked enough to be able to um, to extract themselves to come out of their situations but it's not an easy process and thank you for asking that yeah so one of the questions came in from the audience and it's amazing to hear about your work can you please elaborate on some of the preventive measures for both victims and perpetrators going on here at MGH or um, more broadly in the international community? Um, so preventive measures have been, um, there isn't one single, um, you know, preventive measure that has been found to be successful. So there's, there are many ways of attacking and slicing the onion. Um, there, there are people who are working on policies and laws around um, trafficking to improve our ability to provide resources and improve our ability to prosecute because we're still pretty far behind. Um, and, and to improve in also the resources that are available for prevention um, because that there's so much focus on 
um, the response that the prevention uh, has not been funded well enough. Um, but programs, um, there are programs that are that are targeting children, um, helping them to in age appropriate ways, of course, helping them to understand uh, the risk of um, exploitation. Um, in other countries, I'll talk more, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what other countries are doing. In other countries, there are uh, youth programs specifically for youth who migrate for labor um, that are solely dedicated to, um, in, to educating them and preparing them for the possibility of trafficking. Um, and preparing them from being able to, to, for knowing their rights and for being able to, um, to access uh, services. Um, I'm trying to think of a specific example in Brazil. Um, well, I, I don't have time for that, but um, I think we need to work more around prevention. I don't think that we have enough of this, but a lot of it is education. And a lot of it is educating the professionals that work with youth and that work with um, you know, vulnerable at-risk communities um, to be able to recognize it as before it really it, it happens, to be able to recognize those at risk and to be able to educate those at risk. I'm sorry, that was not the best answer, but there just is not too much um, you know, that I can highlight other no. than education. Thanks so much for, yeah, thanks so much for that response. Um, maybe one additional question, sort of fundamentally here at MGH, um, if on the inpatient or outpatient side of things, we suspect our patient is a, is a survivor or victim of human trafficking, what beyond sort of the trauma-informed care you talked about, is there a way to refer them to the clinic or to get them engaged with the Freedom Clinic? Yes, so um, Dr. Andrea Riley, who is one of our um, uh, primary care physicians in the clinic um, can be reached uh, directly. I can be reached directly. We're both available um, on page as well as through our um, email outlook system. Um, so either one of us can be reached. Um, we also have an, a website um, where there is a contact information form that can be um, pop, uh, filled out and submitted. And then we can reach out to a provider or directly to the person who has been referred. Um, so those are the, the main ways to reach. And I have um, also done some consults on the floors as well. So if those who know how to reach me, might reach out and uh, ask for assistance with dispositions and with um, referrals. And so, um, you know, sometimes I'll go to the bedside as well and engage with the patient. So they're, they're, uh, we're flexible and we try to be available. Um, and maybe just to go along with that is, I imagine, do you guys also document in the electronic medical record in EPIC in a way that people would also know if this is a patient of your clinic or is that hidden off of the record? Yeah. So. It will, um, the record will show that they're a patient. Um, um, I, I actually don't know what it looks like on everybody else's end, but we can see that it's our patient. Uh, so I won't say that I know that what it looks like on everybody else's end, but we can see that it's our patient. Um, and, and that's interesting that you bring that up because uh, I was involved in the uh, creation of the ICD-10 codes for human trafficking. And so I do want to just make one small um, comment about that. Um, I, you know, we do need to have a way of tracking this and of being able to know, uh, you know, who is at risk and who is being trafficked so that we know how to help them. Um, but I would be careful about how you document and uh, about um, the what shows up. Uh, unfortunately, our problem lists populate everything and every single diagnosis that has ever been. So it's an unfortunate, um, you know, part of our medical record keeping. Um, but it is, uh, it, it, it's important to be careful and to be cognizant of how we document this. We don't want to generate stigma and we certainly don't want to put anybody at risk. Um, so uh, it, you, um, I think it would be okay to have, you know, some concern about it in the note. Um, and I will leave that up to everybody's judgment because we all deal with these types of situations in different settings. Um, 
uh, but just keep it, just always keep in the back of the mind that it's important to be cognizant of how we document, how we document domestic violence, how we document into partner violence, how we document uh, this form of, of violence. Thank you so much, Dr. Macias Constantopoulos for joining us this morning. We really appreciate this and all your work here. Um, for all of you that have joined us today, once again, the CME information is in the side and we would invite you to join us again next month. Um, we will have uh, Dr. Sylvester Camayo and Adrian Gardner from Indiana University and Moy University in the AMPATH program. So thank you so much and have a, a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.